Hello followers of Metal Vani. Today we have with us Jacob Bannon of Converge. How does it feel to be the pioneers of a genre? How does it feel to inspire new bands at this point of time? Uh, the way we look at our band is that we're just there's four, four guys that like to make uh, emotional, powerful music that connects with us. Um, so all the other stuff uh, in terms of uh, how it connects with people outside of us four in a room uh, is secondary, you know, and we don't really think about it. We're not really that kind of introspective, you know, we don't kind of go, we don't look at ourselves and go, well, that was a crazy show or... Um, you know, we can't wait to people react toward this record or that, or this record or that record. We just, um, we just enjoy playing and enjoy making music together. I think if we started acknowledging and allowing uh, those outside forces in terms of, you know, people who listen to our music, um, in terms of people who um, listen to our music, connect with our music, if we start allowing those those sort of ideas um, and how people perceive us come into play, we would no longer be an honest band. We'd start thinking about them when we make music, um, and that's just not something that interests us, right? You know, at, at this point in our lives, you know, we we just want to make things that move us, and uh, that's that's really it. So in the recent years, you personally as well as the band have been incredibly busy with the release of the new album as well as the live tour after it. Previous to that, the Blood, Blood Moon uh, Blood 2, Moon, yeah. Blood Moon 2 yeah. as well as the release of the Jane Doe live album. You personally have of course been involved with your independent uh, studio label. From what I've heard, this has contributed to the larger gap in the release of the previous two albums. It's a natural consequence. Yes and no. Um, okay. It's a natural consequence. Yeah, I think there was there was a few factors there. Uh, we were really busy as a band. Converged a lot of touring between 2012 and the release of the, the latest record. Uh, we did it both internationally, um, you know, uh, Europe, States, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we did uh, a fair amount of touring. We did uh, multiple records. We all have projects outside of the band. We all have families. We all have day jobs. You know, even if they're rooted in music and and art in some form, we still have something to do. This isn't just our um, our only thing. So uh, it, that definitely takes a lot of a, a lot of time. I think the the biggest challenge that we have as we grow as a band is figuring out the logistics as to you know how we we can all be in a room or the same state at the same time preparing for a tour writing a record things like that it just takes a lot of uh a lot of organization um but that's pretty much it there was no um there was no clock watching we weren't paying attention to a schedule we were just like hey we should we should probably record some of these songs and it was before you knew it it was almost five years when we started thinking about that so speaking about art, one of the unique traits of the band is that you're also involved in the cover art of your band as well as some of the other independent albums that you work with. Sure. So uh, how does you could perhaps use an example of an album and explain to us how does your how does the theme of an album translate onto the drawing board? Well, it's a uh, it's always an interesting challenge. Um, I'm definitely, I, I definitely don't rule that with an iron fist, you know, like I, I like to collaborate with other artists a lot and other illustrators and designers because I work with a lot of them and I respect a lot of them and what they do and sometimes those aesthetics fit what we're trying to do. Uh, so like for example, I've worked with um, I don't know, uh, Thomas Hooper, uh, Jeff Whitehead, uh, who's Rest from Leviathan, um, I've worked with Aaron Turner, um, Derek Hess. Um, you know, a wide variety of people uh, over the past number of years. Um, I initially started as a designer. Uh, I, went to, I went to art school, started as a fine artist. Then I moved into the graphic design world and I graduated with my, my bachelor's in design. And I really liked the, uh, the world of graphic design where it was essentially a uh, fine art with a brain. And you could uh, take a wide variety of uh, mediums and uh, basically build packages. You could build the, the entire aesthetic and care, visual character of a band or a client or a record label. And it was something that was really uh, 
I don't know, just very challenging and special to me. So I really I got into it really early. I did a lot of early records for uh, for the Hydrahead label um, and a lot of clients, and that's essentially how I started. I was doing a lot of branding and development for uh, for other bands, and I was designing our stuff, but I wasn't doing every aspect of the art for records. And then when we did the Jane Doe release, I actually initially had uh, Derek Hess, uh, an illustrator friend of ours, work on the record, and it just wasn't capturing the I guess the the, the character, the emotional character that I wanted portrayed in uh, in the in the record packaging. So I just kind of took a crack at it, using some of the sort of like cut and paste punk rock techniques that I like to work with, um, which is essentially just like a fine art version of uh, like flyer art. It's really not much different, um, and that aesthetic just happened to grab a hold of the band. It kind of works well with the the sonic elements of our bands. So since then, um, I've done uh, a majority of the records, and I've always designed everything, even in the early days when it was just found art and things like that. So um, yeah, it's a it's always a challenge, you know. But my, my goal is usually just to capture the um, the emotion and the sort of sonic power of the music uh, within the visual, and it's a big. Tr- process of trial and error and takes many months to do so um, and that's what you have in front of you very interesting story thank you um, so next couple of questions are some which you might come across very easily on social media uh, so firstly uh, are you guys planning to release a live album with the blood moon set list in the lineup we've been working on blood moon material um, for a uh, for a long time, actually, since the since we got that project off the ground, when we did the the live touring, that was essentially our experiment to see if we enjoyed it. See, it was it was something that we wanted to do for a long time, and we the, the chemistry was really good between everybody, and we get along and, uh, with each other really well. So there is definitely a future with all of that. Uh, when Converge schedule slows down a little bit, and the Chelsea Wolf schedule slows down a little bit, well readdress all of that um, but there's definitely plans to do do things with blood for sure um, so next question is sometime around the release of the duskiness in an interview you mentioned that some of the best tracks according to you were left out from that album sort of yeah I mean Kurt Kurt actually said that it was it was kind of taken out of context but that we're we're kind of used to that because that happens unless it's a spoken interview um, one of the great things that happens when you when you write a whole bunch of songs is you sometimes you have too many to choose from. And uh, we were, our goal was to really just create a really powerful album. And we recorded around like 18 songs, something like that, maybe more. Um, and then we just really tried to figure out the best way to fit that puzzle together. And all four of us had varying opinions on that. And what essentially becomes the album, as like the Dusk and Us, for example, or the 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 EP that preceded that that came out uh, before that was the I Can Tell You About Pain Eve record. Uh, those are big decisions and compromises that have happened between all the four of us. And so, with that said, uh, the song Eve ended up on that first seven inch, and uh, the album became the album. And there's still a group of songs that haven't come out that have a um, a specific kind of feel. I think that uh, I would define them as uh, more aggressive than the other stuff on the record, and uh, just yeah, more aggressive, more intense, and just faster. Um, and those those will come out. They'll come out. They're they're not hidden away. It's just a matter of just, you know fitting them together. Because sometimes you don't want to release a record that people get bored listening to. Not everybody wants to listen to like an. 70-minute record you know so we wanted to make a, a hard-hitting record and we did and I think we're the next the next release will be as hard-hitting in a different way so next few questions would be based on like gigs in general. Sure. Um, so this might you might have to rack your brain brain for a bit for this question but do you particularly remember a concert that you enjoyed playing at a lot and the exact opposite one where you least enjoyed it you know memories 
a, a difficult thing because uh, we've done there's there's a lot of me- muscle memory involved in, in in playing music and so we've done a lot of shows and we've done a lot of tours um, and everyone's unique it's it's strange I could I could forget one uh, that we played two days ago but in four months remember it like it happens five minutes before um, and it's mainly because our brains are full of stuff we've had a lot of life experiences and um, the um, the repetition of things sometimes uh, makes things the a bit mundane uh, but then uh, you'll remember just like the you'll, you'll remember just like the, the room that you played in or uh, the, the way the stage felt um, the way the sound was sort of shooting around a room uh, and then it kind of whips you right back there um, so it's are there ones that I remember the most? Um, maybe we were talking about this today a little bit. Uh, how many times we actually played this festival? And I remember the 2011 version of it quite well because our stage was uh, ourselves and uh, our friends Terror and I believe a version of uh, the Bad Brains played as well. And it was just really um, I don't know. I, I remember the room. I remember the lighting quite, like quite quite vividly actually for some reason. Um, but I can't really remember all that much of it. And also, too, it's it's interesting now because so much of this music is documented in a live capacity via YouTube, you know, and and so you see, you, you can see things, and you might not necessarily remember them, but your mind is pulled back there really quickly. So during the current concert at Hellfest, I noticed at some point of time you wanted the you wanted a mosh going on in the crowd. So. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you generally expect from your audience uh, during a Converse I, concert? That's more us just kind of having fun, um, especially with an audience like like Hellfest. That there's people that are that are familiar with our band, but then there's a whole lot of people in that see that have no idea, and sometimes they don't know how to react to um, really sort of uh, uh, hyper fast music or something like that so it's some of it's a little bit of like coaching and just kind of having fun with the moment um, we don't really expect much you know sometimes shows are really physical and sometimes they're not and it really depends on the on the vibe the town the city um, you could play the same city five times in a row and have five different experiences depending on you know the, the turnarounds of, of hardcore and punk rock and metal people an area of, uh, of the country or or anywhere might go through a, a period of just having like really hyper aggressive stage divers and then the next time you come back they're all in college and they're gone you know um, but you're still there so we just try to concentrate on playing and doing the best that we can in the challenging atmosphere they're in you know like even today is interesting you know we're on that stage big stage we only have one a sound guy who's real we can't even see him he's in the booth in the back and we have our tour manager who's also a merch guy that's all we have with us we don't have a crew we don't have anything so we set up with you know with the, the great people that work at this festival no sound check just go you know and that's not to knock bands that have the ability to have big production or anything like that we're just a different animal you know so we just kind of go out there and see what happens the energy that you put in your performance is truly infectious how do you keep going at it even now 20 years down the line you just play you know I think some days you're more physical than other days um, bigger stages sometimes feel like they're uh, like you you have more room and so you kind of get rid of that nervous energy a bit I think most bands that are kind of physical that run around a lot more a lot of that is just kind of nervous energy just kind of getting into uh, the moment of a song and that's what it's like for me personally um, but there could be a show where a stage is like super, super tiny and you can't go anywhere. And that's okay too. Um, you know, you just try to do the best with what you got. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Jacob, for having this yeah, no nice talk with us. Thank you. And all the best for your future efforts. Thank you.